Hello everyone and welcome to this very special event brought to you by the RSA and Love Reading for Kids. I'm Deborah McLaren, a Fellow of the RSA and Managing Director of Love Reading and it is my great privilege and pleasure to be joined today by two of my favourite storytellers and I'm sure yours too, the brilliant Catherine Rundle and Sir Michael Mapago, who are here today to talk to us about books, about friendship and the beautiful, wild and wonderful living things of the natural world that are such a deep source of inspiration for them both and their writing. Catherine, Michael, hello, welcome. Nice to hello. see you. Nice to see you. I'm just delighted to have you both here. Now, I'm sure that they don't need much introduction for everyone watching along with us today. But before we dive into our chat, let's just remind ourselves of some of their incredible bodies of work. Michael, we're gonna make him blush now. Michael is one of the titans of children's literature in the UK. He's written more than 150 books over his career spanning 50 years. And he's a multi award winning author of beloved classics, Private Peaceful, oh, that book, Tekensky's Kingdom and War Horse, which of course recently celebrated 40 years in print. He joins us today from rural Devon, where he and his wife, Claire, grew the amazing charity Farms for City Children. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Farming is also the subject of a beautiful book that Michael wrote in 1979, which is accompanied by gorgeous illustrations by James Revilius and poems by Ted Hughes. A new edition of this book, All Around the Year, Featuring an introduction by Catherine herself is out on the 3rd of October as part of a year of celebrations for somebody's forthcoming 80th birthday. I know he doesn't want us to talk about it, but Michael, congratulations. Thank <laughs> you very year. much indeed. Thank you, thank you. I mean, a word of thanks on behalf of all of us, children around the world, readers, teachers, school librarians, parents and carers, for all you have done and continue to do for children's literature, but it wasn't the plan, was it? A happy accident brought you to us that set you on the path to being a writer to date. Talk well, to us about that. <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, I've been, I've been a lucky person most of my life. And I, the lucky thing was I was uh, teaching in uh, primary school, a place called Wickham Brew in Kent. Um, and I, I don't think I was a brilliant teacher of anything except words and stories and poetry. And so they got a lot of that from my year sixes. Uh, but their, their maths was not great, I don't think. But the, the interesting thing was I had a wonderful um, head teacher called Mrs. Skiffington, who came in one day and uh, said in the staff room book, I'm fed up with having to somehow get through three to half past every day at the school. We don't want to teach, we're too tired. The children want to go home. It's a hopeless half hour. So I want everyone in the school, all you teachers, to read a story that you love. And she said that, that you love. The word love is very important in this conversation. Um, don't read anything you're not sure about. Read it with a passion. She was, and she said, then do not ask questions about it. Do not quiz them. No comprehension. Just tell them the story. It can go on all week. It doesn't matter for that half hour. And so we did. And the whole school fell silent for that uh, last half hour of the day. And I, I was reading a book one day and it turned out not to be as good as I thought it was. And the attention span of my you know, year sixes in my mobile classroom, which never moved, um, was um, fading. You know, they were looking out the window and picking their noses and they really weren't interested much in the story. So I didn't know what to do. I went back to Claire, I said, I, I, maybe I'm not reading it right, um, but I did try. And she said, well, no, 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 don't go on with it. Don't bore children. It's the worst thing you can do in a classroom. Don't bore them. Um, make a story up for your own. I said, well, they're 35 year 60s, they'll eat me alive, you know, if I try to do that. And, uh, and I, I said, oh, I'll try, maybe I'll try. She said, go on, go on, go on, go on. You're a pretty good liar, go on, do it. So I went in there the next day at uh, three o'clock and I told them I'm not going on with that book. And they all went, oh, sir, we liked it. Typical year sixes, I don't care if you liked it. I've been up all night making up a story and you're gonna to listen to it. It was very much like that, really. And I started off and to start with, it was the same thing looking out the window. And then gradually, I don't know what happened, that something worked, some chemistry worked. And I was doing what Mrs. Skiffington said. I was telling it with a passion. And I wasn't just telling any old story. 
for comprehension. I was telling it because it mattered to me. So that's what I did. And they sort of caught that strange mood of Mr. Flamengo looking a bit upset sometimes. And anyway, it worked, really worked. And I loved doing it. That's the point. I really loved doing it. And so I went on with it the next day and the next day and the next day. And on the Friday afternoon, Mrs. Skiffington came in and said, I've heard about this story. Can I sit at the back and listen? Which she did. And she came out to me after and she said, Michael, Michael, she said, that was very good, very good. I want you to write it out and give it to me on Monday morning. And no one had talked to me like that since I was about 10. Um, but I did it. And she had a friend who worked at Macmillan and I got that lovely letter, which um, I'm sure Kate has had as well and remembers the first letter that comes back and says, um, yes. But this said, yes, you, one story is lovely. Could you write five more? And this is a good bit. We will pay you. 75 pounds. <laughs> anyway, that was the beginning. I love it. Well, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire, for suggesting that. You've got a lot to thank that lady for. <laughs> yes, but don't tell her that. If she knows it already, but I'll tell her from time to time. Definitely. <laughs> now, we must, whilst we're talking about the wonder of children's books, we have got to talk about Catherine's new book, which is out today it's an extra special day to have you here um and we celebrate the publication of this incredible book impossible creatures um Catherine is obviously one of the most admired and exciting writers writing today mostly known for her children's literature but adored by all of us and Catherine your books are a joy to read I'm really it's a huge honor to have you with you here today but this new book it's published now um by Bloomsbury um it's an epic adventure I mean I know that Michael and I are massive fans it's richly imagined it's beautifully constructed it's a feast a feast of a book um and it was awarded a, a lovely and forget star of star books but I know no one describes it like you did so please tell us about tell everybody about this book so Impossible Creatures is set in an enchanted archipelago hidden from us by magic which is located in the middle of the north atlantic ocean and it's 34 islands and on those islands all the creatures of myth still live and thrive and not just the creatures of myth that we're familiar with so of course there are centaurs and unicorns and dragons but also the creatures of myth that people were familiar with in the 12th and 13th centuries or, or even further ago, which have slightly fallen out of our memory. So things like um, the Al Mirage, a, a, a gold horned hair that you might find in 13th century Persian manuscripts, or um, carcadans, which are a kind of um, furious, man-eating, unicorn-like creature with a poison-tipped horn and skin that sort of hangs off their bones. Um, and I, I wanted to create a world in which all of these creatures, they were not imaginary and they are not extinct. They still exist. We have not destroyed them. And if you know the way, you can get there and greet these creatures yourself. Seriously, how can you just not fall in love with it? It's <laughs> brilliant. Now, Michael, you're a bit of a fan, aren't you, as well? Um, there's a, a, a wonderful, in fact, there's, there's only brilliant quotes and unbelievable quotes about this book, but there's a very special one on the, on the front um, from, from Michael. Michael, and I know actually, Michael, you're not, I've heard you talk before about how actually you don't often risk reading books for children. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear you know, why uh, you made an exception for Impossible Creatures and 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 what you thought about, about this book. Well, I made an exception for Impossible Creatures because it's by who it's by. Um, and and if, you, if you've been following the, I would say career, because it's not a career, a, a sort of pathway that um, mm -hmm. Kath, Catherine has um, been walking down with her writing over a few years, it's, um, it's an extraordinary pathway. Um, and I, I wrote on the front of that book very, very deliberately. I mean, I th do think we've got a, uh, in, she's not new, but I think of her as a new discovery for so many readers out there. To me, she is an inheritor of um, the mantle uh, of Tolkien, 
and Philip Pullman. I'm deeply annoyed she lives in Oxford because they all lived in Oxford as well as I can see. Does things do happen? She knows this outside Oxford in the North Atlantic, actually, they happen quite a lot as well. But what I'm trying to say is that her, it is finally, I mean, I'm not a great fan of, of, of fantasy. This is partly because I can't do it and I sort of withdraw from it. I'm not a great fan of Tolkien. I know plenty of people who are. Of course I do. And uh, I, I love Philip Pullman's books, but I particularly like his books that are not, if you like, linked to. Um, but what I know is that Catherine can do both. And the, the wonderful thing about her as a writer, really, is the manner in which she writes and passes on her story. Now, this, this can be the story of John Donne, you know? It can be biography. And it's done in a way which is, the word accessible is terrible because it seems to imply that somehow she's writing down. She doesn't do that. But she, I think she plays with the reader in a way which is making everything that might not be interesting, interesting. And when I read this book, a wonderful new book, I, I like fantasy, I would say, almost for the first time, because mm -hmm. it has a wonderful, almost like a dictionary at the beginning, an encyclopedia of these creatures. So you kind of get to know who's going to come on stage. And I love that. It, 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 it grounded me while I, was, while I was reading it. But it's an extraordinary um, range of imagination, um, which proper writers have, actually, like Philip and, and, and like Kate, have this enormous range of imagination, which is it's rooted in an understanding of history and of culture and of nature. Um, and they, but they both have this. And uh, it's, it's something I admire hugely. So I can really say if it's the best compliment I can pay to a book of fantasy, I really didn't mind reading it. <laughs> there you go, Catherine. <laughs> Praise indeed. I'm very honoured. <laughs> but it's true because I, and I felt the same with, I know that you read a lot of non-fiction, Michael. I'm not a massive non-fiction reader, but Super Infinite, the story of John Donne, his, his his, his unique and uh, you know his burning uh what do you call it Catherine it, he's a burning original his, that story I, when I heard you talk I was like I have to buy this book it's not what I'd normally read I've got a, and it's it's phenomenal but I suppose it comes at a price because you're you're the speed with which you create your books they're not done overnight are they talk us about your your writing process I'm, I'm not fast. Um, I think uh, John Dunn certainly took the longest. He was a five-year PhD or a few-year PhD, a one-year master's, and then a five-year writing process. And then that five-year writing process was sort of interlinked with impossible creatures. And I, I went back when I was writing the thanks at the end of the book to find the first email I sent my editor about it. And I sent her an email about a girl with a coat that allowed her to fly in 2016. And then um, I asked her how she would feel if I wrote a story that was somewhat based on an epic poem by John Donne, um, because Impossible Creatures is a little bit inspired by one of John Donne's strangest and most uncanny poems. Um, and that was in 2017. So, so I, I go slowly. But, um, and then I rewrite a lot. I edit and edit and kick things out of the book that I don't feel deserve their place. Um, and so it means that that I, I maybe don't produce at the pace that I should, but um, but it's the only way I can make my brain work. They're worth the wait. They're absolutely worth the wait. <laughs> and we've talked a lot. I know that we all feel very passionately about children's literature and and creating books that, that children would love. Um, I'm going to ask you to do a bit of a reading of Impossible Creatures in a minute, Catherine, because we, we, we just have to hear it from your words. But before that, can we just talk a little bit about the importance of us all shouting about books for children? Michael, you and Ted Hughes um, came up with the idea of the role of the children's laureate, because you believe that someone should be out there banging the drum, blowing the trumpet for the best in children's literature. And hey, I'm so glad that you did that. It's been a list of the great and the good um, and 20 years of that drum banging. Um, 
and I'm sure that Catherine will will be on this list, um, uh, you know, before too long. I hope so, hope so. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, is it all you envisaged? That, the um, yes, yeah. even, even more so, I'd say. I mean, we didn't, to be honest with you, if I am honest, and it's good to be honest in a way sometimes, um, it was invented around a fire with a, several glasses of um, Bordeaux um, having been consumed and uh, a bit of an, an I, was, I was quite aggravated really um, because then I think it's better now um, it, it happens actually through people like Kate who actually have respect of an adult audience anyway because they go across the board but there was a lot of patronising of children's mm -hmm. literature going on in those days. It has got better through the, you know, the likes of David Armand and Philip Bullman and um, the whole success, if you like. If you walk down the West End now and you see musicals and children's books all over the place, there's been some sense in which it's grown into its own and it's not quite so patronised. We've still got a long way to go. Um, but I think the, the feeling I had was, well, if there's a poet laureate, which he was, Ted, at oh. the time, oh. um, why shouldn't there be a children? So I said to him, you know, why, why you write children's books? I said, you know, you write like these extraordinary books, you know, his giant book. And he, it's, he, he loved writing for children. He loved talking to them. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we got a children's lawyer? He said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why don't we do something about it? And he said, no, yeah, let's, another step. And then thought, well, who can you get to help us? So we went to all the people, including Mr. Waterston and, and, he did, not, not me, he did this, and it was wonderful. He went to all the right people. He mm. went to the Buckingham Palace and asked someone to come and start it, and all the rest of it, to Princess Anne. So she, he did all that because he was Poet Laureate. And there's a bit of a sadness here because we came together uh, and did we had our first children's laureate, who was Quentin Blake, and by that time, sadly, Ted had died. So he mm. never saw the fruition of it, but now 20 years on, we can see that there's been this wonderful variety of extraordinary talent that's come come through, um, illustrators, poets, novelists, whatever. And um, it's made, I think, some some huge impact. Uh, it's something which, uh, I don't say people aspire to it because it's not that kind of an award, but yeah. I think people, once they are children's laureate, know that it, what is it for? It is exactly that, is to encourage children, parents, teachers, society at large, to put children's books at the front, not at the back of every bookshop mm -hmm. in the country but at the front yeah. because if we don't get them reading young they won't read at all and we yeah. sort of have got that and we know yeah. how bad reading is in this country we've got people we've got governments at the moment congratulating themselves that we're fourth in the league they're always doing this um we're only fourth in the league because two other countries didn't do so well last time so it all sort of adds up to a lot of nonsense that kind of thing what we do know is that our prisons are full of people who don't read and never read uh, and that we have um, a great job to do still so to expand the readership to people, families, mums, dads. Very important that dads read to their children, mums read to their children, and that teachers have that half an hour at the end of the day to do the same thing. Yes, I'm quite um, passionate about it, so I won't go on. No, and Catherine, uh, yeah, it's, it's the importance of reading for pleasure, of children reading with their parents, reading alone, that being read to by teachers, it can't be underestimated, can it? It's just everything. Everything changes when we read. I think so. And there are so many reasons. I mean, we know that we have very good, if, if you want data, we have superb data about the ways that reading for pleasure as a child is one of the finest predictors of later in life success and safety, uh, even accounting for economic um, position. But also, if you can coax a child into reading for pleasure, then you are offering them the cornucopia of human knowledge, like the great song that has been sung by humanity for 3000 years. And if we don't get them reading, then we are cutting them off from that, cutting them off from the wealth of human wisdom and experience and integrity and wit. The best jokes you will find will be in books. And so the idea that we don't invest enough in making children readers, it seems to me a stupidity for which we will not be forgiven. It is, it is devastating to me that things like access are being cut away with our government lack of funding in libraries. Um, and I think this is something that, that so many people who write for children feel so passionately about, that this is the fight that we must fight. 
It's so true. I mean, many don't get to experience the magic of reading that made me a reader for life, that made you both writers and readers. And I think the sad truth is that because of cuts to school funding, many children don't have access to books, do they? You know, one in one in eight primary schools don't have a library. You know, when you look in deprived areas of the country, that rises to one in four schools. It's just heartbreaking. Um, and I know that at Love Reading for Kids, one, one of our things we have done is we've launched this bookstore. So if you do, if people watching, you do buy a book, um, if you buy Impossible Creatures, if, if you buy all around the year, you can donate 25% of that cover price to a school at checkout. And we're giving tens of thousands of pounds to schools in need who, who need books, who we need their children to fall in love with books. We don't believe there's such a thing as a non-reader. They just haven't found the right book for them yet. I think it's I think it's availability. It's, yeah. it's really important that the, the school library, we have plenty of schools that don't have a school library still. And I'll yeah. give you a tiny, tiny little example, which seems very insignificant, but it's key. In my little village here, and in villages all around Devon, um, there are mobile libraries. It used to be a place where on one day a week on a Tuesday, it would come and the village would sort of gather around. Some people would be coming out of the pub with a drink and there'd be the library. And they're cutting them all over Devon now. It's, it's, it's being done. And, they, and it's, these are deprived societies that people can't just sort of walk to the nearest bookshop, even if they had the money to do it. We are, whatever it is, 10 miles from the nearest town. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful service invented by our forebears to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to hit, here are the books, enjoy them. And now we are supposed to be, don't we always get told, the fifth richest country in the world and we can't afford to put books in front of our children. But what's really interesting, I, I think, is that Kate has said, I know at the end of her wonderful Golden Mole book, she said that being angry about it is not enough, you know? Um, it's got to be something more than that. It's, it's something that needs repeating and we need to persuade people, which is partly what your organization and Children's Laureate and these wonderful books that people are writing are doing. And children's writers, people don't sort of realize how often children's writers are going into schools and going into colleges and, and talking and talking. And the more that happens, the more there is the ability to do it. The children the problem now is can the schools afford to, to do that? Have they got time in their curriculum to afford to do that? They must. Because reading, as Kate has just said, is at the heart of so much of the, of the future of our children. Everything. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I and you mentioned before about reading children's books and the reputation of being a children's author. And Catherine, of course, wrote this amazing little book, which was a couple of years old now, but I, I love this book. Um, Catherine, tell us about this, because this, for me, is really important. I read so many children's books, and they remind me of the joy of, of children's books. And I, I think every adult should be reading children's books and reminded them the joy that, that is in the pages. And uh, I think it's really important. So talk to us about this. Uh, so the book is called Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You Are So Old and Wise. And... Its basic argument, I think, could be boiled down to, of course, there are things that children's books cannot do. And I'm not arguing that adults should only read children's books, but occasionally there are things that only a children's book can do. And children's books are designed to be read by those who are without social power. And so often they are about the, the bold, uncompromising truths which, after all the necessary adult compromises of one's life still remain true. And those truths are about things like love and tenacity and power and wit and endurance and care. And, you know, I think because children's books have to be a distillation, they have to be short and tight because otherwise children will not devour them. It requires a, a boiling down and a boiling down of, of perhaps humanity's most vulnerable heart. And so you get essentially in the best children's books, not in all of them, but in the best children's books, almost like a kind of shot of literary vodka, something distilled and, and something that you know, burns in your chest. And I do think that you know, if, 
if sometimes you feel that you have lost your your reading passion, a good way to go back is to read the books that are designed to ignite it in the first place. You know, the Moomins and Alan Garner and Philip Pullman and Wolves of Willoughby Chase and Paddington Bear and Michael Mulpergo, these books which are designed to tell children, this is what a story can do. Oh, that, that, everything. <laughs> Michael, you agree? Um, well, why wouldn't I? <laughs> um, and that's, that, that couldn't be more succinct. Just talking about the, how, how books for young people should be succinct, I think the great thing that Catherine and her fellows in Oxford and elsewhere uh, do is they never, never talk down to children. They speak truth and they look the reader in the eye. And that's difficult, you know, because this this thing that you have to entertain children, and you do. They're not going to go on reading if you don't. But you can do the two. And that's what Catherine manages to do in her in her books, whether they're non-fiction or fiction. She has that, that gift. And I think that's that's so important because I think what children really like is when we it sounds strange with fiction, is when we don't pretend. Yeah. It, it's when you when you tell it as you see the world, as you feel about it, and they know that they know that you mean it. Yeah. And I know that from, I suppose, reading to children. I'm going to read to some kids on who've come down to the farm this week. I'm going to read to them tonight. And if it works, it will work because what I read to them, I'll mean, you know, and they'll, they know will that. absolutely know I'm not pretending. And to start with, that may feel a bit strange, um, but I think it gets through to the heart of them. It, it excites them in terms, I hope, the story itself. They want to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen. But they also care. And, and Kate has mentioned this word love quite a lot, and, and it's in the books and when she was talking about it, it's really important that they know you love what it is that you're telling, uh, that it's not fake. In other words, they deal with fake all the time. Now, I think it's a brilliant um, opportunity. We're going to talk a little bit about all around the year and the golden mole and, and nature in a moment. Before we move on to that, Catherine, would you please do as a little reading from Impossible Creatures so everyone get a feel for the joy within. Just read a tiny bit from the very beginning. Um, so I'll read the first four paragraphs. The beginning. It was a very fine day until something tried to eat him. It was a black dog-like creature, but it was not like any dog he'd ever seen. It had teeth as long as his arm and claws that could tear apart an oak tree. It says, therefore, a great deal in Christopher Forrester's favour that he refused, with speed and cunning and courage, to be eaten. The beginning elsewhere. It was a very fine day until somebody tried to kill her. Mal had returned home from her journey, flying back from the forest with arms outstretched and coat flapping, buffeted by the wind. Mal Arvorian could fly only when the wind blew. That day she had flown over treetops, her shoes brushing the tips of their branches, and swooped low, causing a herd of unicorns to scatter. In the kitchen, her great aunt had grumbled at her cold hands and given her a cup of hot cordial when there was a knock on the door. It was the murderer. Love it. Amazing. You can Thank see you, so you can much. see every word, you know? Oh, That's what's every wonderful. word. Every yeah. word. Thank Perfectly you, placed. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about all around the year. Um, as, as we said, this was originally published in the 70s, um, but it, it was written with a purpose, wasn't yeah. it, Michael? But it, but it was never meant to be published, was it? Another happy accident, a lifetime yeah. of happy accidents. <laughs> yes. No, it was... Um... We came down here, Claire and myself, to Devon, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, to start a project which um, she created called Farms for City Children. And we wanted to set up our first place where the children would come, the first house, the first farm. And we decided to do it here because when she was seven, she came down and stayed in this place and loved it. And she had this experience of the countryside of walking down the deep lanes, as Ted Hughes called them, and walking up farm tracks, meeting farmers, feeding their lambs, grooming their horses looking at slow worms and, and butterflies. All this happened to a suburban child and she, she knew then that's what she wanted to come back to. So every holiday she came back. And years and years later, when 
uh, she had been a teacher and I'd been a teacher, we both concluded very quickly that you can't teach children everything in a school. You teach them a lot, but you can't teach them everything. And actually, the, the most important thing you can teach outside of school is nature and our coming from it and our connection to it and that it belongs to us and we have to have responsibility for it, all those things. So the, the children came down, to, were going to come down to the farm, but here's the problem. I wanted to be on a farm and she did too, because we wanted the children to take part in, if you like, creating the world around them as well. So they would be working alongside farmers, alongside us on a regular farm, not a fake farm where you just feed lambs and <coughs> tick off on a list how many eggs, nothing like that. They would pick up the eggs warm from under the hen. They would help milk the cows and wash down the dairy. They would groom the horses. They'd dig the potatoes. Anything to do with getting them close to the land, <coughs> to the life of a farmer, that's what we wanted. And the problem was that I knew precious little about farming. I'd spent most of my adult life in a classroom, um, which is fine, but I thought you've got to really learn this at first hand. So I thought, go down to Devon, live there for a year alongside the farmer, we'd, the Ward family, who we wanted to work with on this project, who are our neighbours down there. <coughs> and we um, thought, well, what do we do? What do we do? I've got to learn what it is to be a farmer. So for the, a year, I went out every single day and I worked alongside these farmers in a way to become accustomed to how it was to live my life in wellies, in rain, in hail, in snow, in sunshine, creating what it is that farmers did on the land and learning what the work did to you and the satisfaction and the pain of it and the discomfort of it and the joy of it, all those things. Um, and so when the first children came a year later, I was ready for them. And it was Ted Hughes who said, well, it's no good just doing it, Michael, write it down. He was quite a <laughs> strict sort of a, he was a mentor, but he was very strict about it. We're going to write it down, we'll write a diary every single day. Um, and um, then he said, and I'll, I'll tell you what, if you do that, um, I'll, I'll write a few poems to go with each month. How would that be? And I talked to James Revilius about it while I was writing it and said, look, you're the photographer. He's wonderful. He's the son of a wonderful artist called Eric Revilius. And James um, was the local, I suppose you, you'd call him. He was, a, he was a photographic journalist, but the, but the photos are so beautiful and so wonderful. And they're of how it is to be a farmer around here, how country life was, not is, then and it's changed in the 50 years massively. So he recorded that. Sadly, both these wonderful people are no longer with us, but the book is there. And some wonderful publisher called Little Toller said, well, why don't we bring it out? It's nearly 50 years old. It's a good celebration. You're 80 years old. Wouldn't that be a good idea? And I love that because in a way of all the books that I've written, this is the one that formed my life mostly because I then spent the next 30 years living and working on this farm with Claire running farms for city children. It's different now. And there are younger people, people connected closely to the world of education now, and they've taken it on and the charity goes on. And as I'm speaking to you now, there's a group of kids that just came past with um, sacks on their shoulders out to feed the sheep. And what will they see when they go up there? Won't just feed the sheep. They'll see the buzzards still up there, even as we're coming into autumn. They're up there probably logging for the heat of the, the summer that's just gone. And they will see these little trotty wagtails and they'll go down through the wood and they'll walk along the river. And what do they look for? They look for otter sprites down there because they know and have been told to keep your eye out for otters. And um, they, they, they love that. And you'll see egrets and you'll see herons. And so all the time they're learning that this place is there and it's beautiful and it needs looking after, um, which is very important for today. I don't know, why have I witted on like this? What did you ask me in the first yeah. place? <laughs> No, we're just talking about the book. It's great. It's fine because what I'd love to ask, bring Catherine in and, and talk about Catherine's childhood because this connection to nature, as you said, is so important for our children, isn't it? For them to understand where they sit in the wider yeah. world. Yeah. Um, but Catherine, of course, you had this wild and wonderful upbringing, so you know exactly what Michael's talking about. Talk to us about that, if you wouldn't mind. It is one of the reasons that I admire Michael so much because of his understanding that a child does need to be among growing things and things that are alive that are not human because they need to understand the great parliament of the non-human in order to see the full scope of what it is to be on the planet. And I had this 
great, great piece of luck that um, my, my very little youth was spent in, in suburban Camberwell in, in South London. But then we moved to Zimbabwe, where my father worked for international development. And it meant that I had many years just very, very close to wilderness. So there would be um, you know, occasion monkeys in the garden and snakes in the swimming pool and scorpions under the rocks and a kind of cornucopia of living things. And much more excitingly, um, about half an hour, I guess, half an hour by car, a couple of hours walk away, there would be true wilderness. So, um, you know, zebra and giraffe and, and a sense that the world turned and other things lived who had just as much right to their existence as we did and whose beauty was overwhelming and and that beauty and that just the delight for a child of spending time with living things and it is so hard to achieve now harder than when I was a kid every decade it gets harder for children to place their for adults to place their children in the wilderness in part because we've also lost the tradition of letting children play alone and so now because there's no longer that culture of that previously if we were playing alone and we broke something that wasn't my parents fault that was just a thing that happened whereas now I think perhaps there might be more of a sense of parental negligence and I think we perhaps have to push back at that mm -hmm. but but what Michael does and in putting children in the English wilderness and English farming and English skies I think is so brilliant and it's also why I love that book all around the year because mm. it captures so brilliantly it is so richly true about the hard work of making living things grow mm. and it is so beautiful and it has such joy and it is so unromantic that mm. it doesn't say you know there's no sense of like you know, seasons of mist and mellow fruitfulness. And there is work in that book. There are, you know, cows with foot rot and and a sense of failure as well as success on a farm. And I love that it is so true and it it conjures so brilliantly what it might be to to make the earth yield food. And so you wrote the introduction for the book, didn't you? Um, did, did, did Michael call you up and say, hey, Catherine, will you do the introduction? <laughs> I think um, I think somebody, I think probably the publisher emailed me saying, we know that you love Michael's work. You've banged on about it elsewhere, about how much you loved his children's books when you were a child. Books like The Butterfly Lion, which just have such a sense of oh, that, that alchemic feeling that you get in your heart when you're a child and you love an animal. And they were like, well, this also exists. And this is this is a, a sense of the, the stern work, the beauty, the focus, the calloused hands. And I, I loved reading it. And of course, I also am a huge fan of Ted Hughes. I love his poetry. And that poetry in that book is just gorgeous. Brilliant time. Michael, would you mind doing us a little reading from all yes. around the year, please? That's sort of a nice, this, nice segue, safe. Catherine. <laughs> I'll just read, read tiny things from the, this is January, Wednesday the 19th of January, and 1976 I think it was. Pugli has done it at last. First thing this morning, John noticed her udder was swollen to huge pink proportions, and he thought then she would carve sometime during the day. Graham went over after breakfast and took her into the big barn with Violet. There's more room there. By this time she was showing a bag and when she had licked herself all over, she uh, rustled down around in the fresh straw, looking for the best place to lie down. She found it and settled. She was about to carve when Violet's calf came over to have a look, followed closely by Violet herself. This was too much for Pugli, who got back up onto her feet and began to chew the cud again. John did not like the delay, so he drove her back into the ship and again, she carved 10 minutes later. It's a fine Devon Cross Jersey bull calf, Bourneville brown with a hint of blue in his nose. Pugli took him at once and licked him from end to end several times over. Three quarters of an hour later, she was still at it, knocking him over with her affection as he staggered about the ship. So the days are like that, it's birth, it's death. And this is a poem that, um, beginning of the poem, anyway, that Ted wrote about barley, which is maybe my favourite poem in the book. Barley grain is like seeds of gold. When you
turn a heap with a shovel, it flows with the heavy magic of wealth. Every grain is a sleeping princess. Her kingdom is still to come. She sleeps with sealed lips. Each grain is like a mouth sealed or an eye sealed. In each mouth, the whole Bible of barley. In each eye, the whole sun of barley. From each single grain, given time, you could feed the earth. So I was very lucky because Teddy was lived down the road. Um, that again, luck, pure luck. Uh, so he was there and he liked the project because he as a boy used to, he was a town boy really, and, but the mm. moors were very close and he would wander up on and that's really where he learned his fascination from nature, his connection to nature and uh, the harshness of it, what, it, what he felt about it. And um, that's of course what determined quite a lot of what he wrote in, in life. Yeah. Of course. I mean, this this actually links really nicely with, with what the RSA are doing with their Playful Green Planet project. And, you know, we know in this country there's a crisis of children's connection to nature, especially in the cities and towns. I think it's four out of five children lack a connection to nature. Less than 10% of UK kids have access, access to play in wild spaces compared to a generation ago, as, as Catherine was saying before, it, you know, the landscape has changed. So this playful green planet is, a, is an ambitious intervention by the RSA and partners to transform how primary schools foster that connection to nature. And I think that's so important. We know nature is a big part of who you both are and, and, and what inspires you to write. And, it makes you think, doesn't it? If you hadn't have had that, what path you might have taken if you didn't yes, have it, that it, connection you, to books and nature? What you can't do with children is to preach at them and say, oh, it's very important, this nature thing. You know, you've got to, you've got to understand it. You, no, no, no. What you do is you have to bring them to the wild world around them and let them experience it a first time. You've got to stomp through snow. They've got to walk through a wood in, in the autumn. They've got to see the bluebells growing in the spring. They've got to see these things, yeah. and only then will they care about them. And yes. It's about caring, it's about love again. They have to love it, they have to feel part of it. And um, that's what I hope our project is doing, the RSA. And there's so many people out there now doing this, but the outreach is really hard uh, to, to arrange because it, it costs money to get children from Camberwell or wherever out to the countryside. Mm -hmm. And it's no good just coming just for a day and saying, isn't this lovely? Isn't it sweet? Aren't the lands lovely? And then going straight back. They've got to feel it. You know, they've yes. got to feel both the comfort, the discomfort, the joy of it, and the passion for it, and, and get to know the people who work the land and who, who care about it. How do you, um, as writers, strike the balance between making sure that message of nature conservation is heard without sounding too preachy? Well, Catherine does it easily. I'm going to read you a piece. I haven't been invited to do this, but I'm going to read you a piece. She read a paragraph from at the beginning of her last book. I'm going to read you a paragraph from the, the end of this extraordinary book, Golden Mole, which is non-fiction. Sorry about this, Deborah. I know you don't like non-fiction, but there we are. You're going to, you're going to get a bit <laughs> of anything of Catherine's is fine by me. <laughs> uh, this, this is so clear. Uh, and children will love being spoken to directly. And this can inspire them to go out and do it. Here it is. It's um, the human. The world is so rare and so wildly fine, populated with such strangeness and imperiled astonishments. Among them, human attention, active, informed, sustained attention, is perhaps one of the rarest and most powerful. So this book has been a wooing. It has been an asking for your attention and for your wonder, because so much can still be saved. Fear and fury are galvanic, but they will not suffice alone. Our competent and attentive love will have to be what fuels us. For what is the finest treasure? Life. It is everything that lives, and the earth upon which they depend. Narwhal, spider, pangolin, swift, faulted and shining human. It calls out for our more furious, more iron-willed treasury. Well, there we are. It sort of sums up not just her book, but the whole situation that we're in and why children, we can 
have to sort of do this with them, with literature and through literature and other other ways in, into the nature. Reconnect, that, reconnect. It is, and it, it is that, that, that book, it just shows, doesn't it, that the world is more sort of astonishing and, you know, more miraculous than we could ever imagine, really. Um, it's out, I'm just going to say this because it's a beautiful book. It's out in hardback. It hits the shelves in paperback in November and it's shortlisted for the 2023 Wainwright Prize for Nature Writing, which we find out about this evening. So good luck, Catherine. It's a book to be treasured, really to be treasured. I would buy it in hardback myself <laughs> because that's better for the writer. <laughs> Love it. I love it. We've got a few questions. We've got well, not a few. We've got lots and lots of questions. So I'm going to pick out a few, if you don't mind, for us to take us to next. Um, Catherine, do you have a favourite character from your own books? If so, who is it and why? Um, there's a tiny dragon in uh, Impossible Creatures. Uh, Pliny the Elder wrote his natural history 2000 years ago, which is a completely straight genuinely non-fiction account of, of the world's creatures, um, you know, birds and wolves and fish. And in amongst them, he includes the Jaculus dragon, which is a tiny tree dragon that he says launches itself like a dragon, like a javelin at people's faces. And I loved this. I love this inclusion of the dragon. So there's a tiny dragon small enough to sit on the top joint of your thumb in Impossible Creatures. And he talks like a, a I guess, a, a, a a furious drunk academic uh, who has been left alone for a very long time. Um, and I loved writing him. He was he was a great pleasure. So Jacques the Jaculus would be my favorite. Love that. <laughs> Brilliant. Michael, are there any themes or messages you hope readers take away from your books? Well, there are, um, and they'd be very important to me, but. I think what's important is, is the story. Um, and the messages have to come if they're there because the reader finds them there, not because I plonk them there. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, what, what do we have? We have the two most serious problems confronting ourselves on this planet. We have war and peace, and we have what we've been doing to the wild world for the last, 2000 years, but especially during, I have to say, my lifetime. Mm. Um, this is the great destruction. This is a great threat. Um, and so when I do write about war, which I do, um, it's really important to me that when the children read the stories, they're not thinking, well, this is fun. And it's not war, should never be entertainment. Um, I hope they come away thinking, well, we never want to do that. Mm. Um, that seems to me to be rather important. That's an important message. But overall, you know, what I don't know, I suppose it is we know what a mess we got ourselves into with nature. And reading The Golden Mole has been, it's opened my eyes to the, the degree of destruction of uh, these creatures, what we have done. I mean, hedgehogs, I know it sounds silly, reducing it down to a hedgehog. But what do we have? We have 97% uh, have gone. And we're left now. This is in my lifetime, 1950s. Am I right, Kate, or not? Is that about right? Completely right. Completely right. And that level of destruction. And what is this? This is pesticides. It's driving cars. And, um, and I don't know how many I've run over in my life. I'm driving my stupid car around the place. We just got into this habit of thinking these things really don't, we don't mm. care about them. We don't look for them. And uh, these, these are important lessons to learn for children. I, I'd love them to learn them from books. No matter whose yeah. books they are, they learn that, and that's great. But they will never get to learn them from books unless the books are in. They've got to be passionate about the books. Yeah. You know, they've got to, to love that. And they've got to love, I suppose, other places. I mean, uh, it was very pleasant to mention the, the butterfly lion. And Tracy was quite interesting because it mirrors a bit her, her young life in, in Africa as well, which I hadn't really thought of until two seconds ago. Um, mm. But what was what really important about that is yes it touches on war but it's also about the love of a child for a wild animal and how important that is to us and and to them so if you come away from that with a message of actually that first world war was this step into horror 
and a disaster, which we're still suffering from all these years later, and what we're doing to lions still yeah. all these years yes. later. Yes. We haven't yes. learnt, and it's this inability to learn, and I don't know anything that's going to teach people better than books, that's the truth of it, and a real experience of the world around them, not a fake one. And that, that those themes come out in Impossible Creatures as well, don't they, Catherine, because the, there is creatures are dying, the earth is drying, the waters are suffering, an entire ecosystem is rupturing. And the main characters, Christopher and Mala, are told that the protection around the archipelago was to protect them from the relentless destruction by humankind. So amidst the magic and the adventure, there is that really important message that we need to do more, we need to do better. I think so. I wanted children to have the sense that unicorns are astonishing, but narwhals are as astonishing. Hedgehogs are frankly as astonishing. If they were rare, we would find hedgehogs baffling in their beauty. And um, the Golden Mole starts with a quote from G.K. Chesterton, which is, um, the world will not starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. And I think that our lack of careful, political, informed reverence uh, is what has made us end up in an age of destruction. Um, and I think Michael is so right. One of the best ways to teach children will be books, but we can only teach them with books if we get them the books. Absolutely. What, thinking about books again and getting books into the hands of, of children. Um, what advice or, or comments would you have for children who are readers and that want to become writers? Follow your footsteps, both of you. Okay, okay you go first. I'm intrigued to know what you're going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, um, I guess the main thing I would say is if you want to write and you already read, you already spend all your time reading, and reading a, not just one kind of book, but as rich a span of books, nonfiction and fiction and different kinds of fiction and poetry, which teaches you about music and rhythm. I would say then a great way, if you're a child, is to start writing. And the wonderful writer, um, Frank Cottrell Boyce always says, a great discipline is to keep a diary but you are only allowed to write one sentence. And the sentence has to be the most interesting thing of the day. It can be something you heard, you read, the funniest, the saddest, whatever that thing was. And then at the end of the year, you have 365 interesting sentences and you have learned how to work out what is vivid and what matters. And I think that that might be wonderful advice. It's not something that I, I've tried to do it myself. I keep failing, but I have, I have many, many attempts and I am grateful for them. What about you, Michael? Well, I think that Frank's advice to just do um, a sentence a day is is brilliant. Again, I've never I've never managed that, but he's he's dead right. I suppose there's something that comes just just before it, and it's something that um, I, I'm spending most of my life trying to do, and Claire as well, is that before you can write at all, you do have to care, and so oh. you have to use your eyes, your ears your heart um in other words look around you feel the world about you and to enable children to do that seems to me to be the beginning of so much whether i'm thinking of ted hughes and the moors up in scotland or, or kate in zimbabwe it starts with the wonder she mentioned this word wonder which is key to the whole thing the, you have to catch the wonder and once you caught the wonder and you become interested and then you become deeply interested then you will notice more, as Claire did when she wandered the lane. She, she was, in fact, in, in those days, I think she did the thing what you're not supposed to do. She would pick things up and keep them for a day down the bottom of her bed, <laughs> slow worms and the like. She'd be careful to put them back the next day. But it's this business of the minuteness of a child's eye. Uh, it's really very important. So if you see things, notice them and feel them, you know? I think that's all important. The whole business of what you feel is so important in your heart and your hands and the smell, everything, everything, this noticing is so important. And then as Frank said, yeah, write a sentence each day. And then something, what, I mean, I do it from time to time and I find something that is, is completely fascinating. I did it the other day in a hospital waiting room. It's really bizarre. 
I went to a hospital waiting, it doesn't matter why I was there. And um, it was packed. And um, everyone was in silence. And this wonderful woman came in, who was clearly the matron, and said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but there aren't enough doctors here. Um, we are very short staffed and you will not see a doctor for 12 hours. So there was this sort of hushed silence and everyone was um, wondering what to say. No one complained, everyone sat there. And I looked around the room and I thought to myself, what I should do, and I didn't do it, was to tell everyone a story. It's Canterbury Tales, you know? You just tell a story and you keep people, when it's a sort of pilgrimage going to hospital after all. It, and it's, I, and that seems to, it starts you. It, and I've started, I've started writing this story about a hospital waiting room. I haven't got a clue where I'm gonna go. What I love about books is you take this pathway and then you, the pathway finds you sometimes and you do it with hope and not expectation, but with hope. But what I did learn from Ted Hughes and it's something which you can add on, I think to this, is that once you've started, don't stop. Because if you put your pen down or whatever and you say, oh, I can't do it, then the next one is really difficult to start. So it's to keep writing, keep writing and be happy when you've written, but read it out to yourself and say, yeah, 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 that's better than Kate Rundell, you know, it's fine, it's fine. And you can, you've got to feel that you can do it so that you can go on. And the self-esteem, not nasty self-esteem, but the self-worth. You know, I can do this stuff. I can tell a story and they can tell stories. We know that with children. It's a question of getting past the inhibition of writing it down. Anyway. And how, how do you tell a good story? What, what does it involve? Well, it's very difficult. With your own books, I'm afraid it's up to other people to say, which mm. is really annoying because <laughs> I, think, I think every book I write is a masterpiece until the first person reads it. And that's usually Claire, and she says, yes, but. Um, and then you have to go back. And actually, Kate has just mentioned how important rewriting and rewriting is. I am, I do need other people, I have to say, to say things sometimes, both encouraging things and, and uh, critical things, providing not being too cruel, um, which Claire can be from time to time when she says, well, actually, you probably shouldn't have started, but you could do this and you could do that, you know. But I, I don't know, I, yeah, that's, that's roughly what I've got to say about it. But it, it is difficult. There's no question about that. Writing is difficult. But I think for, for children, this business of finding your own voice is critical. And the thing about great writers, and Kate is one of them, is that you recognize a voice and it's, and it's personal, it's, it's private. And what writers are doing is offering you their privacy. This is what I feel about spiders, you know? And this is, this is what I feel about crows. And it's interesting, I've been thinking about, ever since I read this, this golden mole, I've oh, been wow. thinking about crows because we sat outside this morning at breakfast and the crow is going, rah, rah. and I thought that's the same crow that's crowed Kate Rundell up in Oxford. <laughs> Only you're not so well-educated as the ones in Oxford. <laughs> anyway, we had a bit of a giggle about it. You know? But it's, it's echoes, it's all echoes. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Listen, we are running out of time and I, I could sit here all day, but I, I know that um, Catherine needs to get to a, a giant dragon um, on, <laughs> on Piccadilly. So we, we need to, to, to let her go. Uh, Michael needs to go and prepare to, 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 to read to the children on, on the farm. I mean, I, I just need to get back to my, my, my boring email inbox. But I hope everyone watching has had such an amazing, um, enjoyable time listening to, to, to Michael and to Catherine chat about literature and the importance of reading and immersing our children in, na in nature. Thank you both so much. Thank you much Barbara, very much. For Thank you, Kate. Us. Good, Thank good you, luck Mike. at Watersons, knock them dead. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you to everyone for joining us this lunchtime, for your questions and your engagement. Um, I hope you've had as much fun as we have had. Any questions we haven't had time for today, we will try and answer and respond to directly. But thank you, everyone, and goodbye.